Jacobitism was a political movement in Great Britain and Ireland that aimed to restore the Roman Catholic Stuart King James II of England and his heirs to the thrones of England, Scotland and Ireland. The movement took its name from Jacobus, the Renaissance Latin form of Iacomus, the original Latin form of James. Adherents rebelled against the British government on several occasions between 1688 and 1746. After James II was deposed in 1688 and replaced by his daughter Mary II, ruling jointly with her husband and first cousin William III, the Stuarts lived in exile, occasionally attempting to regain the throne. The strongholds of Jacobitism were parts of the Scottish Highlands and the lowland northeast of Scotland, Ireland, and parts of northern England. Significant support also existed in Wales and southwest England. The Jacobites believed that parliamentary interference with the line of succession to the English and Scottish thrones was illegal. Catholics also hoped the Stuarts would end recusancy. In Scotland, the Jacobite cause became intertwined with the last throes of the warrior clan system. The emblem of the Jacobites is the White Cockade. White Rose Day is celebrated on 10 June, the anniversary of the birth of the Old Pretender in 1688. Political Background from the second half of the 17th century onwards, a time of political and religious turmoil existed in the kingdoms. The Commonwealth ended with the restoration of Charles II. During his reign the Church of England was re-established, and Episcopal Church government was restored in Scotland. The latter move was particularly contentious, causing many, especially in the southwest of Scotland, to abandon the official church, attending illegal field assemblies known as conventicles in preference. The authorities attempted some accommodation with Presbyterian dissidents, introducing official indulgences in 1669 and 1672, meeting with some limited success. Towards the end of Charles's reign those with more radical Presbyterian opinions, known as the Covenanters, who favoured rejecting all compromise with the state, began to move away from religious dissent to outright political sedition. This was particularly true of the followers of the Reverend Richard Cameron, soon to be known as the Cameronians. The government increasingly resorted to force in its attempts to stamp out the Cameronians and the other society men, in a period subsequently labelled as the Killing Time. Since the late Middle Ages, the kingdoms of England and Scotland had been evolving towards a quasi-oligarchical or collegiate form of government in which the monarch was held to rule with the consensus of the land-owning upper classes. The reigns of the last three Stuart kings, Charles I, Charles II and James II and VII, were marked by growing royal resistance to this developing consensual model of government. In part the kings were inspired by the development of royal absolutism in contemporary Europe, exemplified particularly strongly by their neighbour and contemporary, Louis XIV of France. In part, however, the apologists of royal authority based their claims on a just assessment of the powers claimed by England and Scotland's medieval monarchs. In 1685, Charles II was succeeded by his Roman Catholic brother, James II and VII, in addition to sharing his family's absolutist views of government. James attempted to introduce religious toleration of Roman Catholics and Protestant dissenters. In 17th century Europe, being a religious outsider meant being a political and social outsider as well. James tried to encourage the participation in public life of Roman Catholics, Protestant dissenters, and Quakers such as William Penn the Younger. Such attempts to broaden his basis of support succeeded in antagonizing members of the Anglican establishment. In Ireland, James's viceroy, Richard Talbot, 1st Earl of Tyrconnell, was the first Catholic viceroy since the Reformation and acted to reduce Protestant ascendancy and to garrison Irish military outposts with troops loyal to the views of James. In England and Scotland, James attempted to impose religious toleration, which helped the Catholic minority but alarmed the religious and political establishment. William of Orange building alliances against France, 
lobbied the English political elite to have James replaced by William's wife Mary who was James's daughter and next in line to the throne, but they were reluctant to rush a succession expected to happen in due course. Then in 1688 James's second wife had a boy, bringing the prospect of a Catholic dynasty, and the immortal seven invited William and Mary to depose James. On 4 November 1688 William arrived at Torbay, England. When he landed the next day, at Brixham, James fled to France. In February 1689, the Glorious Revolution formally changed England's monarch, but many Catholics, Episcopalians and Tory royalists still supported James as the constitutionally legitimate monarch. Scotland was slow to accept William as king, but he summoned a convention of the estates which met on 14 March 1689 in Edinburgh and considered a conciliatory letter from William and a haughty one from James. Forces of Cameronians as well as Clan Campbell Highlanders led by the Earl of Argyll had come to bolster William's support. On James's side a more modest force of a troop of 50 horsemen gathered by John Graham of Claver House, by Count Dundee was in town, and he attended the convention at the start but withdrew four days later when support for William became evident. The convention set out its terms and William and Mary were proclaimed at Edinburgh on the 11th of April 1689, then had their coronation in London in May. Religion While Jacobitism was closely linked with Catholicism from the outset, particularly in Ireland, in Britain Catholics were a small minority by 1689 and the bulk of Jacobite support came from other groups. Catholics formed about 75% of the population of Ireland. In England, however, not more than 2-3% of the population could have been practicing Catholics, though in the north and south of England, at least one half of the population outside the towns were Catholic in some degree by this definition. Catholics number 10 to 15 percent of the English population. Catholicism survived most strongly among the nobility, of whom 15 to 20 percent clung to the old faith. In Scotland, it is estimated that about 2 percent of the population were Catholic. Ireland Irish support for James II was mostly from Catholics, though by taking the French side against the League of Augsburg, James was siding against the papacy politically. William was allied to many Catholic states, including the Holy Roman Empire, and his elite force the Dutch Blue Guards had the papal banner with them. The war in Ireland was predominantly a Catholic uprising, and after its defeat in 1691, the Catholics' only military contribution to Jacobite support came from the Irish Brigade of the French Army. Jacobitism in Ireland had its roots in support for the Stuart dynasty dating back to the accession of James I to the throne in 1603. Gaelic poets in Ireland lauded James as the first Irish king of the three kingdoms of England, Scotland and Ireland, because of his family's Gaelic ancestry. James and his successes were also viewed as being less hostile to Catholicism than the Tudors. In the Wars of the Three Kingdoms of the 1640s, Catholics organized in Confederate Ireland pledged allegiance to Charles I and Charles II against the English Parliament. As a result, most Catholic landowners had their lands confiscated after Parliament's victory and the Catholic Church suffered harsh repression. James II, the first openly Catholic King of England in over a century, was therefore viewed as a saviour by Irish Catholics. James appointed an Irish Catholic, Tick Honnell, as Lord Deputy of Ireland, readmitted Catholics into the army and militia and introduced toleration for the Catholic religion. During the Williamite War in Ireland, he also reluctantly agreed to proclaim the autonomy of the Irish Parliament from the English one and the restitution of lands confiscated from Catholics after the Cromwellian conquest of Ireland. The demands of religious toleration, legislative autonomy and land ownership were the three key elements of Irish Jacobitism, which remained influential until the mid-18th century.
The majority of Irish people were Jacobites and supported James II due to his 1687 Declaration of Indulgence or, as it is also known, the Declaration for the Liberty of Conscience. That granted religious freedom to all denominations in England and Scotland and also due to James II's promise to the Irish Parliament of an eventual right to self-determination. England and England some support came from the non-juring Anglicans, which started with Church of England clergy who refused on principle to take the oath of allegiance to William and Mary while James still lived. Ing developed into an Episcopalian schism of the church with small congregations in all the English cities. In many respects, Jacobites perceived themselves as the heirs of the royalists or cavaliers of the English Civil War era, who had fought for James II's father Charles I and for the established church against the parliamentarians, the latter standing for the primacy of parliament and for religious dissent. Jacobite supporters displayed pictures of both Cavalier and Jacobite heroes in their homes. Scotland in Lowland Scotland, the Catholics tended to come from the gentry and formed the most ideologically committed supporters, drawing on almost two centuries of subterfuge as a minority persecuted by the state and rallying enthusiastically to Jacobite armies as well as contributing financial support to the court in exile. Highland clans such as the Macdonalds, Macdonalds of Clan Ranald, Kepic, Glengarry and Glencoe, the Clan Chisholm and the Ogilvies were largely still Catholic. Other clans, such as the powerful Camerons, were Episcopalian, and as staunch Jacobites as their allies, the Catholic Macdonalds. The clan chief who led his men at the Battle of Culloden, the gentle Lochiel, survived to command the French regiment d'Albany, and died at Burgs in 1748. Scottish Episcopalians provided over half of the Jacobite forces in Britain, and although Dundee's rising in 1689 came mostly from the Western Highlands, in later risings Episcopalians came roughly equally from northeastern Scotland and from the Highland clans. The Episcopalians were also described as nonjurors. As Protestants they could take part in Scottish politics, but were in a minority and were repeatedly discriminated against in legislation favouring the established Church of Scotland. The clergy could even be imprisoned, as occurred in the Stonehaven toll booth after three clergymen held services at the chapel at Mucknell's Castle. However, many Episcopalians were quiet about any Jacobite sympathies and were able to accommodate themselves to the new regime. About half of the Episcopalians supporting the Jacobite cause came from the lowlands but this was obscured in the Risings by their tendency to wear Highland dress as a type of Jacobite uniform. To the Gaelic-speaking Scottish Highland clans, to whom the supporters of Jacobitism were known as Sia Masaich, the conflict was more about inter-clan politics than about religion, and a significant factor was resistance to the territorial ambitions of the Campbells of Argyll. There was a precedent for post-1689 Jacobitism during the period of the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, when clans from the Western Highlands had fought for James's father Charles I against the Campbells and the Covenanters. Another factor in Highland Jacobitism was James VII's sympathetic treatment of the Highland clans, whereas previous monarchs since the late 16th century had been antagonistic to the Gaelic Highland way of life. James had worked sympathetically with the clan chieftains in the Commission for Pacifying the Highlands. Some Highland chieftains therefore viewed Jacobitism as a means of resisting hostile government intrusion into their territories. The significance of their support for the Stuarts was that the Highlands was the only part of Britain which still maintained private armies, in the form of clan levies. During the Jacobite Risings, they provided the bulk of Jacobite manpower. Opportunists and adventurers Another source of Jacobite support came from those dissatisfied with political developments. Some Whigs, most obviously the Earl of Mar, reacted to political disappointments by joining the Jacobites. 
but while others were courted from 1692 onwards and indicated support, mostly this was just reinsurance in case the Jacobites came out on top. The Tories were a more likely source of support given their commitment to church and king, but many were reluctant to trust the Church of England to a Catholic king. At times such as 1715-22 when the Hanoverians appeared to be dismantling Anglican dominance and 1743-45 when Whig dealings denied the Tories parliamentary victory they would coalesce and turn to the Jacobites but they were reluctant when it came to serious action. Nevertheless, this gave hopes that large numbers of Tories would support a Jacobite rising with a serious prospect of winning, particularly when helped by foreign intervention. The rise and fall of the earlier Tory alliance with the Jacobites forms a major part of the background for Sir Walter Scott's Bride of Lammermoor. Other Jacobite recruits could be described as adventurers, desperate men who saw the cause as a solution to their problems. Although small in number and varying from unemployed weavers looking for excitement to impoverished gentry like William Boyd, 4th Earl of Kilmarnock who served Charles as a colonel and became a general after the Battle of Falkirk. They contributed significantly to the daring that brought the Jacobites a prospect of success in their campaigns. However, other such mercenaries often became spies and informers. Jacobite ideology Jacobite ideology comprised four main tenets the divine right of kings, the accountability of kings to God alone, inalienable hereditary right, and the unequivocal scriptural injunction of non-resistance and passive obedience, though these positions were not unique to the Jacobites. What distinguished Jacobites from Whigs was their adherence to right as the basis for the law, whereas the Whigs held to the idea of possession as the basis of the law. However, such distinctions became less clear over time, with an increase in the use of contract theory by some Jacobite writers during the reign of George I. Jacobites contended that James II had not been legally deprived of his throne, and that the Convention Parliament and its successes were not legal. Scottish Jacobites resisted the Act of Union of 1707, while not recognising parliamentary Great Britain. Jacobites recognised their monarchs as kings of Great Britain. The majority of Irish people supported James II due to his 1687 Declaration of Indulgence or, as it is also known, the Declaration for the Liberty of Conscience, which granted religious freedom to all denominations in England and Scotland, and also due to James II's promise to the Irish Parliament of an eventual right to self-determination. Jacobite Community and Policy From its religious roots Jacobite ideology was passed on through committed families of the nobility and gentry who would have pictures of the exiled royal family and of cavalier and Jacobite martyrs, and take part in like-minded networks. Even today, some highland clans and regiments pass their drink over a glass of water during the loyal toast to the king over the water. More widely, commoners developed communities in areas where they could fraternize in Jacobite ale houses, inns and taverns, singing seditious songs, collecting for the cause and on occasion being recruited for risings. At government attempts to close such places they simply transfer to another venue. In these neighborhoods Jacobite wares such as inscribed glassware, brooches with hidden symbols and tartan waistcoats were popular. The criminal activity of smuggling became associated with Jacobitism throughout Britain, partly because of the advantage of dealing through exiled Jacobites in France. Official policy of the court in exile initially reflected the uncompromising and transigence that got James into trouble in the first place. With the powerful support of the French they saw no need to accommodate the concerns of his Protestant subjects, and effectively issued a summons for them to return to their duty. In 1703 Lewis pressed James into a more accommodating stance in the hopes of detaching England from the Grand Alliance essentially promising to maintain the status quo. This policy soon changed, and increasingly Jacobitism ostensibly identified itself with causes of the alienated and dispossessed. 